Hey everybody, so let's go ahead and launch into our test th three review. So first of all, um, make sure that you follow the same kind of steps that we have in every single other test this semester. Make sure first of all that I can read your work because if I can't read it, I can't grade it. Um, and make sure to show your work because the more work you show, the more partial credit I can give if you make a mistake. Honestly, I really don't care whether or not you get the right answer. I care more about the physics that led you to that right answer and your thought processes and the logic. As such, you need to be able to show me what equations you used, be able to show me the steps in your math and everything like that. And if you don't show me enough work that I understand that, you know, you could get there and figure it out, then I can't give you the right, uh, give you credit even if you got it right. Um, I do allow a 3 inch by 5 inch index card for an equation sheet, so you can bring that. Please do bring a calculator and some scratch paper and something to write with, but um, I'm not going to allow any anything with internet access, basically, basically. So no cell phones, no tablets, no PCs, no smart watches, nothing like that, okay? Um, so what's going to be covered on the test if you go by our Matter and Interactions textbooks and the chapters? We're covering Chapter 6 on the Energy Principle. We're covering Chapter 7 on Internal Energy. We're skipping Chapter 8 because we cover that stuff in our Modern Physics class. Um, chapter 9 is covered except for Section 4, but we did talk a lot more about moments of inertia than is covered in Matter and Interactions, so be sure to check out the notes and Kleppner and Colin Cow, our supplementary text for that. Um, and we also supplemented with a discussion of spherical coordinates, which isn't touched on as much in matter and interactions. Um, chapter 10, we're skipping. In chapter 11, we cover the whole chapter. Um, remember, of course, that we are not testing you on your vPython or coding skills on tests. Um, the coding is enough for that. Um, as with every single test, I do expect you to be able to recreate some of the derivations that we did in class and some of the derivations for homework. For um, this test, I want you to concentrate on being able to find the moment of inertia for symmetrical objects. Um, from that, you're going to have to do the full proof with the integration and everything, so make sure that you know how to do those ones that um, we covered in class or that were assigned for homework. Also, um, we covered energy and potential energies in this unit, and so make sure that you know how to derive the formulae for the potential energy for gravity here on Earth, MGH, make sure you can derive that. Make sure that you can derive the potential energy for Newton's law of universal gravitation, which we'll go over. Make sure that you can derive the equation for, for potential energy for springs and the potential energy between point charges, that Coulombic interaction. Um, when you do these interactions, or to do these derivations, make sure that you start from the formula for work. Um, for finding the work done by the conservative force and remembering that the work is equal to the negative change in the potential energy of the object. Also, here are some sure bets on things that you need to know, to problems that you need to know how to be able to work for the test. Make sure that you can work energy conservation problems. Make sure that you can work angular momentum conservation problems and torque problems. And make sure that you can do those damped driven harmonic oscillator problems. That's also hit on on this test. Okay, so. Here comes the Tobacco Auctioneer Review of Chapter 6, which is entitled The Energy Principle in Matter and Interactions. So in case you hadn't heard, energy is conserved, modern physics notwithstanding with the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. We're going to go with the classical interpretation here. So that means that energy can't be created or destroyed, and if the amount of energy in a system changes, then that's because energy was transferred to or from that system. Um, by some acceptable method of energy transfer, like dissipation due to heat, or, for example, a uh, push or a pull, something like that, something non-conservative. We talked about the formula for work. For work done by a constant force, then the uh, work is equal to the dot product of that constant force with that displacement that it undergoes. Remember that for a dot product, the magnitude is the vector 1 times vector 2 magnitude times the cosine of the angle in between them. So a work done by a conservative, uh, by a constant force, excuse me, would be the force times the displacement times the cosine of the angle in between the force and the displacement. Work's a scalar, right, because it's the result of a dot product. And the SI unit of work is the same as, of course, the SI unit of energy, which is the joule. 
Notice here from this formula that only components of the force parallel to the displacement do work, and forces perpendicular to displacements do no work. Now, that was for a constant force, but forces don't have to be constant. So in general, the work done by a force is the integral over the force in the displacement, the integral of F dot dr. Now, kinetic energy we defined as 1 half mv squared. It's the energy of motion. And of course, the SI unit of this is the joule as well. So it's 1 half times the mass times the speed squared. And a change in kinetic energy is one possible result of transferring energy into or out of a system. If the system loses kinetic energy, energy has been transferred out. If the system gains kinetic energy, it's been transferred in. This is summarized by the work kinetic energy theorem, which says that for an object, the sum of the works done on or by that object, sum of the works, is equal to the change in the kinetic energy. And if the net work is positive, then the kinetic energy increases, and vice versa. If the work's negative, the kinetic energy decreases. So if you have a work problem, it's kind of like an energy conservation problem, basically, um, then what you want to do for these problems is to first, and you usually start here, Draw your free body diagram. Remember, free body diagrams are just simple sketches that show all the forces acting on the object. Okay, So you draw vectors, arrows, symbolized by arrows, for all the forces acting on the object. Making sure in your free body diagram that you've labeled your coordinate system and put that in the picture too. Then what you want to do is you want to go ahead and write those forces in their vector components. Okay, so according to your coordinate system that you've chosen, what are the uh, vector components for each one of those forces and write those out. And then, of course, you're going to apply Newton's laws to determine any unknown forces. So this is going back to how to solve the free body diagram force problems from the previous uh, test. So make sure that you can do that and apply those Newton's laws to determine any unknown forces. Now, Find the work done by a specific force. Remember, using the work formula, F dot dr, right, and integrating that. If it's a um, non-constant force or if it's a constant force, the dot product of the force with its displacement. You can do the net work for the system by either finding the net force and then finding the work done by the net force or finding the work done by each force and then adding them up. Those things are equivalent, okay? So that's how to find the work there. Um, all right, moving on. The work done by a conservative force on a particle moving in between any two points is independent of the path taken by that particle. Okay, this isn't true for non-conservative forces. Non-conservative forces are path dependent, but conservative forces are path independent. Um, that means, of course, that the work done by a conservative force on a particle moving through a closed path is going to be zero. So, for example, if I'm talking about the work done by gravity on this fork, if I move it through a loop, gravity is always pointing down here. So any work done by gravity, any work that my hand has to do to counteract gravity lifting it up is going to be then, you know, given back to me on the way down. So that's the conservative force deal. So um, not all forces are conservative. Gravity, springs, things like that, those are conservative forces. But pushes and pulls, tension, um, friction, those kinds of things are non-conservative forces. So make sure that you have that set up in your head and you understand that. Now, for conservative forces and conservative forces only, we can associate the potential energy for a system with the conservative force. In general, the way that we would do that is the work done by a conservative force is equal to the negative change in the potential energy as the object goes through that um, displacement. So the work done by a conservative force is equal to the negative change in the potential energy that the object undergoes, which is equal to the integral of F dot dr. You could also say that component-wise, each uh, component of the force, for example, the x component of the force, would be equal to the negative derivative of the potential energy with respect to that component. So fx is equal to minus du dx. Now that's true for every direction, not just x. So what we do is we introduce and talk about the gradient operator. In Cartesian coordinates, the gradient operator, which is indicated by an upside-down triangle with a vector over it, is equal to the partial derivative with respect to x times i hat, plus the partial derivative with respect to y times j hat, plus the partial derivative with respect to z times k hat. Okay. Remember that when you do a partial derivative, you only are taking the derivative with respect to explicit dependence on that variable, and you're treating any other variable there as a constant. Okay. 
So then what we do is we say that the force is the negative gradient of the potential energy, or the force is minus the gradient of the potential. You should be able to derive these expressions. We derived them in class, okay? So make sure that you can do these derivations from the framework established here, finding the work done by it by integrating the force, okay, associated with each one of these. And you can solve for what the potential energy due to uh, universal gravitation is. It's U is equal to minus G little m big M over R, where G is the universal gravitational constant. G is 6.673 times 10 to minus 11 in SI units. M is um, mass 1, big M is mass 2, and then R is the distance in between the two objects. The Coulomb potential is the potential energy in between two charges, Q1 and Q2. The Coulomb potential is expressed as 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times Q1 times Q2 divided by R. 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, that's our Coulomb constant, okay? Epsilon naught is the primitivity of free space. So epsilon naught is 8.854 times 10 to the minus 12 in SI units. Q1 and Q2 are the magnitude of the charges in Coulombs, and R is the distance in between those charges. Now bear in mind that both of these have the potential going to zero as the objects get infinitely far apart, okay, because there's that 1 over R dependence there, and 1 over infinity is zero. All right, now the others, spring potential, um, that's 1 half K times delta S squared. Here K is the spring constant, and delta S is the extension or the compression of the spring. And for gravity here on Earth, U is equal to MGH, where M is the mass, G is 9.8 meters per second squared, the magnitude of the acceleration due to gravity, and H is the height of the object above or below the uh, uh, origin. Okay. Remember that it's okay to have potential energy, energies that are negative. The potential energy is just the energy that is stored in a system due to the configuration of the objects with respect to one another. So it's okay for a potential energy to be negative. In fact, my potential energy is negative right here, right now, because I'm on planet Earth, and I'm bound to the system of Earth. And that means that, of course, I'd have to get in a rocket and give myself a lot of kinetic energy to have enough energy to escape the potential well that I'm in right now. So negative potentials just basically mean that you're bound, okay? So that's okay. Now, if you have multiple particles in your system and you're trying to find the total potential energy of the system, then you have to sum over all the pairs to find the total potential energy um, or the work, conversely, that it would take to separate the objects. So, for example, if you wanted to find the potential energy of a system of point charges and you had three point charges, then you have to find the potential energy between charge 1 and charge 2, charge 1 and charge 3, and charge 2 and charge 3. So you'd have to find the interactions of all those and then sum them up. A way to represent that mathematically is indicated here, that the total potential energy is equal to 1 half times the sum of I uh, from 1 to N, not letting I equal to J, and then summing over J for each pair. Now that double counts, um, so that's why the 1 half's out front. But if this freaks you out on the test, I wouldn't give you more than, say, three or four objects, so it wouldn't be hard to list that out, okay? So if this notation freaks you out, don't worry about it for the test, you'll be fine, as long as you remember to sum over all pairs. Okay, now if there's no non-conservative forces like friction or drag or things like that, then uh, the mechanical energy, the so-called mechanical energy for the system is conserved. Remember that the mechanical energy is defined as the sum of the kinetic and all the potential energies, okay? And if there's no non-conservative forces, then this sum of kinetic and potential is going to be constant. So, for example, for a mass on a spring, oscillating back and forth on a spring, when the object is at its equilibrium position, the extension or compression of the spring is zero. That means the spring potential energy is zero. But since the total mechanical energy has to be the same at all times, then that means that when the spring potential energy is zero, the kinetic energy is maximized. Okay, so that's how it works. Energy is exchanged back and forth between kinetic and potential in a conservative system in order to keep the sum the same. If you have energy conservation problems, which you will, you'll have to solve one for the test, here's the steps that you follow. As always, you're going to want to draw a picture. Um, and the picture should include all of the elements that you have uh, for your system, so all the system's constituents. And you're trying to determine the system for which the energy will be conserved. So 
what you want to do is then usually what happens in an energy conservation problem is that the system goes through some kind of change. Maybe it's a mass oscillating on its spring. Maybe it's an object falling from a height or something like that, or some combination of the two. A mass falling from a height onto a spring which is compressed. Something like that, okay? So what you need to do is figure out two points in time where you can calculate the mechanical energy of the system. And then solve for what the expressions for the mechanical energy of the system are at time one and time two. And then if energy is conserved, you can set the mechanical energies of those things equal at time one and time two. Okay. So I've summarized that idea here. You're going to figure out what you're looking for and decide on the two positions, which we'll call, say, for example, initial and final. Having a reference frame or a coordinate system chosen for that, then write out the mechanical energy for position one and for position two, right? Remember, there might be more than one type of potential energy, okay? So, for example, if you've got springs and gravities on, then you've got to account for both of those, and so sum both of those up, okay? Then set those expressions equal and solve. If energy is not conserved, then basically you do the same thing, except now instead of setting E initial equal to E final, you set the change in energy equal to the amount of energy lost and then that would just be, maybe be, you know, the energy is sucked out of the system by friction or something. And so that's the work done by friction is the amount of energy lost or something like that. So that you set the delta E equal to the amount of energy lost. It would be, for example, minus FKD, where FK is the force due to friction and D is the distance that friction acted through. Okay? Something like that. Um, just because we went over the system so much, I thought I would go ahead and remind you of the system for a pendulum. Remember that a simple pendulum is a, um, a string or a chain or something like that of negligible mass with a heavy, uh, what could be considered point mass on the end of it, okay? And then what happens is you pull uh, the uh, mass back from its equilibrium position, which is when the the string and the mass are just hanging straight down. You pull it back to some angle, and then you let it go, and you let it swing back and forth, okay? So, of course, at play here, the um, mechanical energy would be kinetic plus gravitational potential. Gravitational potential here, if you put your origin at the bottom of the swing, then MGH, H would just be the height above the bottom of the swing. Now, remember that we wrote that out, that H height as L minus L cosine theta. And if you need a review of why that is, you should go back to that video and rewatch it, okay? So, um, yeah. Now, at the, at the max displacement, right, where you pull it back, that's going to be the turnaround points of the motion. So, where it goes up to its highest height and turns around and comes back the other way, the velocity is zero instantaneously at that point. So the kinetic energy is zero there, and at that point you can solve for what the total energy is. It would be mgl minus l cosine theta max, and that would be your E total. At the bottom of the swing, right, h is equal to zero, and so there you have your maximum kinetic energy and hence your maximum speed. Another system that we concentrated on a lot for energy conservation problems was gravitational potential energy, say for something like a satellite um, here on Earth, or a body and Earth, or a body and a planet, you get the point, right? So here the mechanical energy would be um, one half mv squared, where little m is the mass of the object and v is the speed of the object, so that's the kinetic energy of the object. And then the, the gravitational potential energy in between those two would be minus g big m little m over r, okay? So the total mechanical energy is as shown here, one half mv squared minus g big m little m over r. Now, in a bound system where the object is, say, stuck on Earth or in orbit around Earth in some way, then that mechanical energy is going to be less than zero because the potential energy is negative here, okay, and the kinetic energy isn't high enough to escape. But if you do give particle enough kinetic energy, then it can break free of that gravitational pull. In that case, then maybe your energy is greater than zero, okay? So if your mechanical energy for this system, k plus u, is less than zero, then the mass is bound, and you've got some kind of orbit, okay? Um, or the object's just sitting on Earth. Um, if uh, the energy is greater than zero, the mass can escape. Um, if it's equal to zero, then that shape of the, of the path of the particle is a parabola, and if it's greater than, then it's a hyperbola. Now, if you set the energy equal to zero, then the mass can just barely escape, because that's the threshold kinetic energy required for escape, and then the speed at which that happens is known as the escape speed, okay? So that's that parabolic shape. 
If you set the energy equal to zero, then you have one half mv squared is equal to g big M little m over r. You solve for v escape, and that's the square root of two g m over r. Now, if for example you're sitting here on planet Earth and you want to escape, then the m and the r there would be the mass of the Earth and the radius of the Earth. Okay. So that's how to solve the escape speed for a planet. All right, so that's pretty much chapter six. Let's move on to chapter seven, internal energy. Um, the internal energy is um, all the energy of a system that's associated with the microscopic components. Remember, we talked about the system being made up of atoms and molecules, um, and the internal energy uh, increases the kinetic and, and potential energy of the constituent of the object. We talked about temperature. It's associated with how hot or cold an object feels, and it's how we measure the internal energy of the system. Higher temps mean higher internal energies. The SI unit of temperature is the Kelvin, but you can convert easily from Kelvin to Celsius using these formulas shown here. Now, dissipative forces um, can pull kinetic and potential energies out of a system and convert it to internal energy, and that increases the temperature of the object and its surroundings. And this is covered in the first law of thermodynamics, which states that the internal energy of the system comes from heat and work. Now, if the temperature of an object changes, we can relate it um, to uh, the change in the internal energy via the following formula. The change in the internal energy, delta E internal, is equal to mc delta T. Here, M is the mass, C is the specific heat, which is a property of the um, material itself, and delta T is the temperature change. Make sure that's in Kelvin. All right, we also discussed the concept of power. Power is the time rate of energy transfer, which is a change in energy divided by a change in time. If you take your time change down to a little tiny time, then it, the instantaneous power can be defined as P is equal to dE dt. If work is used as a method of energy transfer, then the power from work would be dW dt. Okay? The instantaneous power is the limiting value um, as delta t approaches zero. If you plug that in for work, dW dt, then you can see that um, since work is f dot dr, then if you assume you have a constant force, then the uh, dr is what changes in time. So then you have f dot dr dt, which is f dot v. Okay, so the SI unit of power is called the watt. One watt is equal to one joule per second. Um, you might hear horsepower sometimes. Uh, it's not as common now, but you can still hear it occasionally. One horsepower is equal to 746 watts. You can also use units of power to talk about energy. A kilowatt hour, for example, is something that might show up on your bill, and that's just because a joule is kind of a tiny little unit of energy. But a kilowatt hour is if you have one hour and um, you uh, have a thousand watts, right? So you have one kilowatt is 1,000 watts times an hour, which is 3,600 seconds, so that gives you 3.6 times 10 to the 6 joules. Um, remember that for unit conversions and things like that, I'll give you the unit conversion, um, or it'll be on your constant sheet, okay? But you do have to know what you're looking for. All right, we talked about drag. Um, so let's talk about it here. Air resistance and drag are uh, not neglecting the effect of the medium pulling on an object as it moves through that medium anymore. We've been neglecting air resistance and thing, drag up to this point, but now we're going to consider it. Um, we have two equations for drag or air resistance. The first um, that we covered is the one more commonly used for air resistance. Um, it's for high speed, high density objects that are moving through a low density medium. In that case, the equation for drag is proportional to the speed of the object squared, okay? And so the equation for air resistance can be written as one-half C rho A V squared, okay? Remember, C is the drag coefficient. A is the cross-sectional area of the object moving through the medium. Rho is the density of the medium, okay? The drag coefficient is something that's usually determined experimentally by placing an object in a wind tunnel or something like that. Remember that when you drop an object and it starts to fall through the air, that what will happen is it will speed up, and as it speeds up, the force of air resistance will also increase because it's proportional to the speed squared. So as it falls and it gains speed, the air resistance 
increases in magnitude until eventually the magnitude of the air resistance is equal to the force of gravity downward. Okay, this happens at the so-called terminal velocity or terminal speed. So if you do a free body diagram for that, you have the force of air resistance pointing up and mg pointing down, and they're equal to one, one another. So if you set that equal, then you can solve for what the terminal speed will be. Okay, and for um, air resistance, where it's proportional to v squared, the terminal velocity is equal to the square root of 2 mg over um, c rho a. That's supposed to be a c there. Sorry. Okay, now there's another equation for drag, and it's for viscous friction for lower speeds. So in this case, if you have a lower density object moving through the air, or if you have um, a more viscous medium, a thicker, more dense medium, um, then you're going to have to say that the viscous friction is what it's called, and it's proportional to the velocity or the speed, not the speed squared. So in this case, we write F is equal to minus CV, where C is a different drag coefficient than the one we saw before. In that case, um, still the same idea applies. It'll still reach terminal velocity, but in this case, V terminal is mg over C. Remember that um, if you have an uh, object moving horizontally um, through, uh, through the medium, then what will happen is that if you just give it a push and let it go, then air resistance is going to pull on that object, slowing it down. If the only horizontal force that you're considering is the, the air resistance in that direction, then the speed will decay off exponentially. Okay? And so we derive this in class. The speed as a function of time will be the initial speed given times e to the minus t over tau, where tau was equal to m over c. Um, if it's falling under the influence of gravity, if you let it drop like that, then what will happen is it will exponentially approach the terminal speed. Okay, And in that case, the velocity can be described as v of t is equal to g times tau times 1 minus e to the minus t over tau. All right, So it's going to hit that terminal speed eventually, but it approaches it like an increasing exponential. Um, we did a deeper dive into the harmonic oscillator before we launched into damped-driven harmonic oscillators. Um, and so remember everything about a harmonic oscillator for this test. This is, the, this is the last one, and we've been working on harmonic oscillators all semester. So let's remind ourselves of some of these definitions. First of all, the period, big T, is the time interval required for the particle to go through one full cycle of its motion. And that's the inverse of the frequency, which is the number of oscillations per second. Now, we also define the so-called angular frequency, okay? The angular frequency is 2 pi times the regular frequency. So you can write f is equal to omega over 2 pi, and then omega is equal to 2 pi over the period, okay? Remember that we find the angular frequency by um, taking the square root of the spring constant divided by the mass, or the angular frequency squared is k over m, where k is the spring constant and m is the mass. Remember that for a simple harmonic oscillator, the position is a function of time, if it was oscillating, say, in the x direction um, horizontally, is a times cosine omega t plus phi. Here a is the amplitude of oscillation, omega is that angular frequency, t is time, and phi is the phase shift. Okay? Basically, that just means that it doesn't have to start at its maximum displacement at t is equal to zero, that it can start wherever it likes, and you just shift the phase constant um, appropriately. Remember that the velocity and the acceleration are time derivatives of the position. This is how they're, um, the velocity is time derivative of the position, and the acceleration is time derivative of the velocity. So this is how they're related. This is how they're defined. For a simple harmonic oscillator, that means that the velocity is dx dt, which is minus omega a sine omega t plus phi, and that the acceleration would be minus omega squared a cosine omega t plus phi. Okay? Remember that there is absolutely no way that you should use your kinematics equation um, for uh, simple harmonic oscillators. It won't work. They just go back and forth, okay? Um, if you need to solve for that phase constant, then what you do is you set the um, a cosine omega t uh, plus phi equal to the position at some, the known position at some known time, and then you solve via taking inverse cosines. Okay, so that's basically it. If the position's at its max displacement at t is equal to zero, then the phase constant is zero. But if not, you use those initial conditions to solve. And we did that in some problems. Now, for a simple harmonic oscillator, um, the energy, of course, of any system 
is k plus u. So k is 1 half mb squared, which is 1 half m omega squared a squared sine squared omega t plus phi. Okay, that comes from the equation of b of t. The potential energy is 1 half kx squared for a mass on a spring. And so that would be 1 half k a squared cosine squared omega t plus phi. So if you sum these two expressions, you have the total mechanical energy. And you can see here that um, this is going to be 1 half kA squared times sine squared plus 1 half kA squared times cosine squared. And the sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. So that means that the total energy of a simple harmonic oscillator is constant, and it's equal to 1 half kA squared, where A is your max amplitude there. So this total mechanical energy is constant, and the energy is exchanged back and forth constantly in between kinetic and potential. So when um, kinetic is at a maximum, potential is at a minimum, and vice versa. Now, if you have a spring that's moving up and down, then it's also being influenced by gravity. What that does is it offsets um, the, uh, the unstretched position of the spring. So basically, uh, if you didn't allow the spring to oscillate and you just hung very carefully the mass on the spring and allowed the force of gravity to extend the spring, then that's going to be, at that, at that still position, the new equilibrium position if you give it a jolt and pull it down and allow it to oscillate. So that new equilibrium position or the shifted position under the influence of gravity would just be mg over k. If you set mg is equal to kx, then you can solve for it that way. And then the mass oscillates about that new equilibrium position. We have a whole lecture about this online if you need a review. Now, that's kind of a deeper dive into a simple harmonic oscillator. Now let's allow the motion to be damped for um, dissipative forces to take hold. Because, of course, real harmonic oscillators have friction and damping. Now, the only analytical solution that we've gone over that you can do is the one for viscous friction, where the damping is proportional to minus CV, okay? All others you have to solve numerically. And so in that case, you're solving the differ differential equation MA is equal to minus KX minus CV. Now, we found and derived in class that the solution to that equation is X of T is equal to a times e to the minus gamma t over 2 times cosine omega t plus phi. In other words, uh, what you've got is your oscillatory term from the simple harmonic motion, like we've kind of had before, and then multiplied times the decaying exponential that causes that modulation to damp out over time. Here, gamma is c over m. Um, omega naught squared is k over m, but what will happen is when you add damping, this will also shift the frequency of um, oscillation as well. And so the new angular frequency, omega, with damping, is the square root of omega naught squared minus gamma squared over 4. And then here, phi is the, phi is the phase constant, like always. Okay, so the so-called natural frequency of oscillation, omega naught, is if there is no damping, and that's just omega naught squared is k over m. If you add in damping, it'll shift that frequency from the natural frequency. Now, a lightly damped oscillator, um, the energy is going to decay almost exponentially. And um, you can say that E of t is equal to E naught, E to the minus gamma t, where E naught is the initial energy and gamma is that damping factor, which was C over m. Okay, and so the energy of that lightly damped harmonic oscillator decays almost exponentially. There is a wiggle to it, as we showed in class, um, but you could fit it very well with the decaying exponential. Now, the quality factor of an oscillator is a measure of how much it is damped. So we can express the quality factor Q as omega over gamma. So that brings me to damped driven harmonic oscillators. So let's say now that we have a harmonic oscillator that is subject to damping, but is also subject to a driving force. And um, just so that it's an interesting problem, because of course if you just push it one time, not super interesting. Let's say that you keep pushing and driving the oscillation. And you do that with a sinusoidal force. Let's call it F naught cosine omega sub D times T. The omega sub D is the angular drive frequency. Okay? All right, so our differential equation now looks like MA is equal to minus KX minus CV plus F naught cosine omega DT. Now, what we did was we said, okay, well, what's going to happen is eventually the whole system is just going to oscillate at the drive frequency, right? That's what's going to happen. So we're going to guess a solution of A times cosine omega dt plus phi, right? That's our guess. 
and then we plugged that guess back into our differential equation. And from that, we derived um, the equations for the phase shift um, and for the amplitude of oscillation. Okay? The amplitude of uh, a damped driven harmonic oscillator can be written as F naught over M divided by the square root of omega naught squared minus omega drive squared squared plus gamma squared omega drive squared. Remember here, omega naught is the natural frequency, which is the frequency without any damping, which is the square root of K over M. And then omega drive is the uh, frequency at which the system is being driven. Okay, gamma is that C over M and F naught is how hard you're pushing it, the force that you're pushing it with. Our phase constant phi is minus gamma omega drive divided by omega naught squared minus omega drive squared. Okay? So we derived that in class. This one was kind of a lengthy derivation, so I wouldn't expect you to recreate it on a test unless that was the whole test, which it's not. Okay, now remember that um, what you can do with a damped driven harmonic oscillator is you can do a frequency sweep and uh, measure the amplitude response of the system with different drive frequencies, okay? So you, you sweep the frequencies and then you plot the amplitude or energy response to the drive. And if you do that, then what you'll see is a plot kind of like this one right here, okay? When the drive frequency gets close to the natural frequency of the system, of the oscillator, then the amplitude response is huge, and this phenomenon is known as resonance. The curve shape for this is a Lorentzian function, and you see this kind of um, shape a lot in energy spectra. So what folks do is they analyze these sweeps, right, this amplitude response curve, and they look at the width of the curve at half of the peak maximum, and they use what's called the full width half max to describe how well, how good of an oscillator it is, okay, how lightly damped it is or heavily damped, that kind of thing. It turns out that the quality factor is related to the full width half max um, by the equation Q is equal to omega over gamma, which is equal to omega naught divided by delta omega, where delta omega is that full width half max. Okay, so you can find your quality factor by fitting the resonance curve and finding the location of the peak and its full width half max. Okay, so that was chapter 8. Chapter 9 um, and Chapter 11 went a little quicker, covered a little less material, and they were on translational, rotational, and vibrational energies. Now, we didn't cover all of Chapter 9. We skipped certain sections. The parts that we uh, you're expected to understand for the test are covered here in this uh, lecture. So, first of all, we talked about relative motion, which if you're in modern physics, you've heard a lot about this semester, but here we go. Let's say that we have two inertial frames, which means they're not accelerating, but one is moving with respect to another. So, let's say that the moving frame is called the prime frame, so we'll call it S prime, and it's moving at a constant velocity, shown here as U, with respect to a stationary frame. Okay, you have to assume that the origins of the frames coincide at time t is equal to zero. And then let's say that you want to describe the events, some event, in either frame. Then you should be able to relate how you would describe the event in frame one versus frame two according to some simple equations. Okay, so let's say that um, if you're trying to describe the position of an object, in one frame with respect to another frame, then the position in the moving frame, r prime, could be written as the position in the stationary frame, r, minus ut, where u is that relative velocity and t is time. Then if you take the time derivative of that equation, you could get the relative velocities as measured by frame one and frame two. And so, for example, the velocity of an object moving um, through space in the moving frame would be v prime, and stationary frame would be v, and you could relate v prime and v via v prime is equal to v minus u by taking the derivative of the position equation. So we went over all that so that we could understand if you have an object that now isn't a point particle anymore, but has some extent with respect to, you know, dimensions or coordinates, it's rotating, it's vibrating internally, things like that, then how would you describe the object? The total kinetic energy of the object would have to be the sum of the translational kinetic energy of the center of mass, right, plus the relative kinetic energy of the object rotating or vibrating about itself. So K total would be K trans plus K relatives, 
Okay? You can find the total kinetic energy, though, by summing up the kinetic energies of all the little constituents or parts of the system at any given point in time. And so k total would be the sum of 1 half times mivi squared. Now this relative kinetic energy can be rotational, it could be vibrational, something like that. Okay, um, The momentum of the center of mass um, is something that you could find, and that would be the momentum of the system or the center of mass is equal to the total mass times the velocity of the center of mass of the object. And so what we could say is that k translational would be equal to 1 half um, divided by m total times the momentum of the system magnitude squared. Now you can find the velocity um, of the center of mass by using the um, position equation for the center of mass and taking the derivative of it, which is Vcm is equal to the sum of mi vi over m total. Okay, And then the relative velocity uh, would be the velocity of any given particle with respect to an origin minus the velocity of the center of mass. So in other words, whatever velocity a particle has, if you subtract off the velocity of the center of mass of the object, that gives you the relative velocity of that particle with respect to the center of mass of the system. So vi relative is equal to vi minus vcm. So what that means is that you can find the relative kinetic energy by taking the total kinetic energy and subtracting off the translational kinetic energy. We did some problems like that. Okay. Now focusing in on rotational kinetic energy. An object that's rotating about some axis with an angular speed omega has a rotational kinetic energy even if it doesn't have any translational kinetic energy. So for example, if I hold the center of mass of the fork still and then spin it, it's still got kinetic energy because the little constituent parts are moving, right? We can find that by um, saying that uh, your, you've got a tangential velocity that depends on the distance r from the axis of rotation, v is equal to omega r, and so if it's uh, the i particle, then it would be, um, uh, vi would be omega times ri. I'm sorry, I got the subscripts mixed up there. Um, so then the kinetic rotational energy would be the sum over all the little particles of 1 half mi ri squared times omega squared, because it would be 1 half vi squared, and vi is ri omega, okay? Now, we define from this the moment of inertia. Okay, the moment of inertia is defined as the sum of uh, mi ri squared for uh, a system of point masses. And so this means that the rotational kinetic energy of object could be written as 1 half i omega squared, where i is that moment of inertia. Okay, so there's our definition of the moment of inertia. i is equal to the sum of mi ri squared. Remember that here, the r is the distance from the axis of rotation to the point in question. Okay? distance from the axis of rotation to the point in question. It's always that. The dimensions of the moment of inertia are going to be kilograms times meters squared in SI units. Okay, now if you've not got point masses but instead you've got a continuous object, then what happens is your little mi's are actually little delta m's of the total bit. And then what you can do is integrate all the, over all that little differential mass units. And so i is equal to the integral of r squared dm. Now, of course, it's not so easy to integrate across mass, and it's much easier to integrate across a spatial coordinate. So what we do is we uh, use a uh, density expression and convert from a dm to a position coordinate. So, for example, if you know that copper is 8.9 grams per cubic centimeter, okay, and then you have a little differential mass unit, then you can say rho dv, and that's equal to your dm. So for our moment of inertia, we have i is equal to the integral of rho r squared dv, and dm is rho dv, okay? Now, you can have volume mass densities, like I talked about here. That's the mass per unit volume, where rho is equal to m over v, and then dm is rho dv. Or if you have a flat object, like a sheet of paper or something, then you can talk about the mass per unit area um, of it. Okay, and then that would be usually symbolized by a sigma, um, and then uh, dm is sigma dA. Or if you have something like a rod or a straw or something where it's a mass per unit length that's um, of interest, then we often use the Greek letter lambda, and then dm is lambda dL, where lambda is the mass per unit length and dL is the differential length. 
We derived the moments of inertia for some simple objects. Some of them are shown here, okay, um, and some others for homework. Make sure that you can do these derivations for simple objects, um, like the ones that you did on your homework or the ones that we did in class. So make sure that you review those because that's one of the proofs that you might have to do on the test. Now, these are um, these will be given to you if you need them, okay? So you don't need to waste your note card space on moments of inertia for common objects. They'll be given. Um, but these are the moments of inertia about the uh, symmetry axes for these objects, okay? So what if you're um, rotating the object not about the symmetry axis? What do you do then? Well, you use the so-called parallel axis theorem. And that states that if you're rotating at about an axis that's parallel to an axis where you know the uh, moment of inertia, that your new moment of inertia about the new axis will be equal to the moment of inertia about the known axis, the known moment of inertia about the known axis, plus md squared, where m is the mass of the object and d is the distance from the center of mass or whatever known axis you have to the new axis. All right, now to do all these um, moments of inertia integration, it might be helpful to remember your cylindrical and your spherical coordinates. So just remember that cylindrical coordinates, um, instead of x, y, z, you have r theta z, where r is the um, distance in the horizontal plane, in the, um, shown here is the x, y plane, but whatever, uh, the x, y plane, uh, from the point uh, the, pro the projection of the object's position in the horizontal plane, the distance from the origin to that point. Theta is the angle that swings counterclockwise um, to that uh, vector, and then z is the z height. So instead of um, x, y, z, you use r theta z. Remember that the conversions uh, for um, uh, these from cylindrical to uh, two Cartesian coordinates go as x is equal to r cosine theta, y is equal to r sine theta, and then z is equal to z. We also have spherical coordinates, and that's useful too. Um, in that case, rho, theta, and phi are the uh, coordinates instead of x, y, z. And rho is the distance from the origin to the point. Theta is the same as the cylindrical coordinate theta, swinging counterclockwise from the plus x axis. And then phi is the angle swinging down from the z axis to the position vector, okay? Um, remember your volume elements if you need to do these integrations, okay? Make sure you remember your volume elements. For spherical coordinates, for example, dv is equal to rho squared sine phi d rho d phi d theta, okay? Um, so there you go. And I know we reuse um, we reuse variables, and I'm really sorry about that, but you're just going to have to be able to keep it straight from one formula to another what each thing means. Okay, moving on, uh, chapter 11, we talked about angular momentum and torque in that chapter. First, we had to review cross products or vector products. So um, we've already talked about dot products. That's when you multiply two vectors and get a scalar. A cross or a vector product is when you multiply two vectors and get another vector. So for example, for generic vectors a, b, and c, the cross product of a and b equaling c, so c is a cross b, then the magnitude of the vector c, the length of c, would be the magnitude of a times the magnitude of b times the sine of the angle in between them. Okay. And then the direction of the vector c is given by the right-hand rule. So remember that we had two forms of right-hand rule that we talked about. One is the gun, and the other was stop in the name of love. For the gun, this is vector a, this is vector b, and this is vector c. And then for stop in the name of love, you point your fingers in the direction of a, sweep your palm towards b, and your thumb is c. So either one of those two methods for finding the direction is fine, whichever you prefer. Now, another way to do a cross product is to straight up just solve for it, just grind through it. And so if you want to do that, then you can do a determinant of this 3 by 3 matrix as shown here. And A cross B, the determinant of the 3 by 3 matrix, the first row of the matrix is the I hat, J hat, and K hat unit vectors. The second row is the components of A, and the third row is the components of B. And then you take that determinant and you end up with A cross B is equal to A, Y, B, Z, minus A, Z, B, Y, I hat, minus A, X, B, Z, minus A, Z, B, X, J hat, plus A, X, B, Y, minus A, Y, B, X, K hat. Say that nine times fast. All right, now why we, re we reviewed cross products was so that we could... Um, adequately cover angular momentum and torque, which are, of course, vector cross-product equations. 
So the angular momentum of an object is defined as the cross product of the position vector with the momentum vector. So L is equal to R cross P, okay? Something doesn't have to be making circular motion or elliptical orbits or whatever to have an angular momentum. You can just have a straight up angular momentum vector about an origin if, if an object is moving with respect to the origin, okay? The SI units of angular momentum are kilograms meters squared per second. Um, and so the magnitude of the angular momentum will be given as MVR sine of theta, where theta is the angle in between R and momentum. And, of course, since it's a cross product, L is going to be perpendicular to the plane formed by R and P. Angular momentum of a superposition. So if you have a system of particles, the total angular momentum of the system can be solved by finding the vector sum of all the angular momenta of the constituents. Now, if you look at the angular momentum in terms of the position of the momentum vectors here, okay, then um, you can see that uh, what you're doing when you do that vector cross product, uh, L is equal to RP sine of theta, is you're basically finding what's known as the lever arm, okay? So R sine of theta is the component of R that's perpendicular to the momentum vector. And sometimes that's written as L is equal to R per P. It's also correct to say that it's RP perp, where uh, you're multiplying R, the total magnitude of R, times the component of the momentum vector that's perpendicular to R, but that's done less often than R perp P, okay? Um, and it's because of that sine of theta that the components of R and P that are parallel to one another don't contribute to the angular momentum. All right. Um, when we're talking about rigid um, bodies, and remember a rigid body is something that um, uh, all the little constituents of the mass are fixed with respect to the other, so basically solids, okay? Um, in that case, then you can find the angular momentum of the rotating rigid body. Um, if you go over a summation of all the little r cross p's for all the little delta m's, okay? When we did that, we derived the equation that the angular momentum was equal to, in magnitude, the moment of inertia times the angular speed. So L would be equal to I omega, okay? Um, oftentimes, you'll find that the angular momentum vector and the rotation axis are fixed. However, are, are the same, fixed with respect to one another. However, there are cases where you have a distribution of mass where it's, you know, asymmetric, and then your angular momentum vector will point not in the same direction as omega, right? That's when you need to rotate your tires, and we talked about that. Okay, um, so um, L is equal to I omega, and you can write the rotational kinetic energy um, in terms of the angular momentum as well. So um, K is equal to 1 half L squared over I, that's the rotational kinetic energy, or 1 half I omega squared. We already covered 1 half I omega squared earlier, so I'm not going to belabor this point too much. Now, if something is moving through space and rotating about its axis, like say you're picturing a, a, a spaceship that's um, rotating uh, about a planet orbiting a planet and also the space station itself is rotating about its own axis, then the total angular momentum would be the um, angular momentum of the center of mass of the object orbiting the Earth and also the angular momentum uh, rotating its own axis. So you, you sum those two. All right, torque. Torque is the tendency of a force to rotate an object about an axis, okay? Um, torque is a vector and um, it's equal to R cross F. And so the magnitude of torque is RF sine of phi, um, where of course phi is the angle in between the um, point of application and the force and the um, lever arm R, okay? So here it is, torque is equal to R cross F. Um, and you can see here that it obeys the right hand rule, okay? Now it's important to realize that Torque and force are not the same, okay? The units aren't the same, all right? The units of torque are newton meters, which is not the same as newtons, okay? And also remember that torques aren't exerted um, just by any old force. The force has to be at some distance from the axis of rotation, okay? So it can't be on top of the axis of rotation. That won't work. It has to be some distance away r, and it also has to be at the correct angle with respect 
to the position vector pointing from the axis of rotation to the point of application of the force, it has to be at the right angle in order to get it to rotate, okay? Um, so it can't be parallel or anti-parallel, for example. Now, although the units of torque are newton meters, you don't write that as a joule, okay? Um, torque is unit meters, and even though a newton meter and a joule do sound awful similar there, okay, uh, remember that torque is not energy, all right? Torque is not energy, torque is a vector, um, and uh, torque is a vector, and um, so we always talk about the units of torque as a newton meter. Okay, now forces cause changes in translational motion, but they can also cause changes in rotational motion via the torque, okay, so just remember those things. And also remember that the torque is R cross F, which is equal to the time rate of change of the angular momentum, dl dt, and we can also express the torque as I times alpha, where alpha is the angular acceleration, okay? So since L is equal to I omega and torque is equal to dl dt, then you can say torque is equal to I alpha. Lots of times the strategies for torque problems are summing up the um, torques caused, or the forces that cause the torque, so you're summing over all possible torques and then setting that equal to the moment of inertia of the object times the angular acceleration to solve the problem. That's the strategy for a lot of torque problems. So torque is equal to I alpha is kind of the rotational analog of Newton's second law if you want to think of it that way. So remember that in our chapter 4 or 5 stuff where we had the free body diagrams and we were drawing all the forces acting on the object, right? And we sum those forces up, and we set them equal to Newton's second law, which is ma. That's kind of the same thing here. You're summing up all the torques that could cause a change in the rotational motion, all the r cross, r cross f's, and you're setting that equal to the rotational analog to Newton's second law, which is torque is equal to i alpha. So when you do these torque problems, make sure that you draw your free body diagram, but make sure to draw it as an extended object because um, the angle in between um, uh, R and F and the distance uh, from the axis of rotation to the point of application make a difference in the torques. So label the forces acting on the object where they act. Identify your rotation axis. Usually you want to put your rotation axis at the origin. Okay. Remember that torques that cause counterclockwise rotations we call positive and torques that cause clockwise rotations we call negative and then sum all those torques to get the net. Okay. So you have several expressions for torque. Torque is equal to dl dt is equal to r cross f is equal to i alpha. So you have to remember all these and set the expressions equal in order to solve the unknowns. Remember that if you have no net torque, um, no net external torque for a system, then that means that dl dt is equal to zero, which means that your angular momentum is conserved. Okay. So if you have no net external torque, then you can use then these are conservation of angular momentum problems. So um, even if the mass of an isolated system undergoes redistribution in some way, that'll change the moment of inertia, but it's not an external torque, okay? And so you can say that the angular momentum is conserved. So I initial omega initial equals I final omega final is equal to some constant, okay? Because the net external torque is zero. So for these conservation of angular momentum problems, draw a picture if it's possible, make sure to draw as an extended object, label all the constituents and any changes to the system, identify your origin, which you should probably set as your rotation axis. Find the initial angular momentum for each of your system constituents, remembering that counterclockwise is positive and clockwise is negative. Sum all those angular momenta together to get your initial angular momenta. Then repeat that for your final angular momenta, and then set them equal to solve. Okay. So if you have an isolated system, there's several things that can be conserved, and this is kind of a summation. You can conserve energy, right, if there's no dissipated forces. You can conserve momentum if there's no external forces, and you can conserve angular momentum if there's no external torques. So these are some conservation laws that physicists use to solve problems. All right, and then the very last thing that we covered um, are gyroscopes, gyroscopes and tops. Remember that gyroscopes are discs or tops that are mounted on a rotation axis or axle as shown here. And what happens is that um, torque is exerted by gravity. Remember that if your top's not spinning, it'll just flop over because of the R cross F due to gravity and it'll just fall to the side. But if your top is spinning, 
then it's got um, an angular momentum vector associated with the spin, okay? Um, and so then the torque due to gravity can actually cause the direction of the angular momentum vector to change, which causes the axle of your top to precess like this, okay? Now, the precession angular speed and the rotation speed that you initially give it, um, so I call them little omega and big omega, those are different values. Usually your precession is slower than the spinning on its own axis. And so here our angular speed of precession, big omega, we derived this in class, is equal to rmg over i omega. Okay, so um, make sure to review all that and... Um, yeah, I think we're finally to the end of our tobacco auctioneer tour of the last month or so of physics. Um, I hope you are good and you get it. If not, feel free to ask me any questions. Feel free to go back over the other videos. And as always, I'll see you in class.